welcome everyone to this week's um, empirical household finance class on peer effects. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna first start with um, some very, very brief introduction into today's topics, peer effects in household finance. And then I'm going to start um, talking about research and I'm gonna talk about um, one of our own research projects, peer effects and product adoption. And then I'm gonna introduce um, some data set that we've constructed and used and that we used for in this area, the social connectedness index. Okay, so that's kind of roughly the, the roadmap. And then um, Johannes, Anke, Florian, Jordan, um, Emily and so on will take over and talk about their own work. So peer effects and household finance. Why are we even talking about this? Well, there's a sense that peer effects and social interactions are likely to be very important in household finance decisions. Why is that? Well, first of all, we have inexperienced individuals. There are many household finance decisions that people undertake only a couple of times or maybe even only once in their lifetime. Think about buying a house, buying a car, investing for retirement. These are things that people just don't do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so when they start looking into how do I buy a house? How should I finance that house? Um, what type of mortgage do I get? How much should I put down? These are new decisions to many individuals and they're likely to look to family and friends for advice. It is also an area where expert advice is somewhat limited and especially expert advice that people trust. We do have financial advisors and there are banks and mortgage brokers and so on, but these are people that, you know, often individuals don't fully trust that they're going to give them objective advice. And so that makes it even harder. And advice from family and friends and learning from their experiences is something that people often feel more comfortable with. And so we think that in many household finance decisions, it's just very likely that peer effects play a very important role in how people come up with these decisions. But and we want to not just think about why peer effects might be important, but actually quantify them. It is relatively difficult to study peer effects empirically. Two of the main challenges are first the measurement and second the identification. Let me talk a little bit more about those. So when I mean measurement, we need to observe both a peer's um, both peers, who your peers are, as well as the individuals and the peers' choices in the same data set. And that's already a big hurdle. In many data sets where we have individual level choices, it is very difficult to identify peers. And if we identify peers, it is then not necessarily given that we would actually observe data on these individuals. Of course, once we have that setting, we're also inherently in an environment where we have big data. So if you have N individuals, on an average, they have NF friends, then we have data on N times NF individuals. So this becomes very, very big data. And we need to find environments where this large data is available and available for research. The second challenge, even if we have measurement, even if we have these types of data, is identification. We know that people tend to be friends with people that are similar to them. This is what we call homophily. That means people who are friends or who are peers to each other are both exposed to common shocks as well as have common preferences. What are common shocks? Well, common shocks are things like, you know, Johannes and I are both at NYU, and so if a firm puts up a big billboard in front of our building, then we both see that. We are exposed to the same common shock, and so are all our colleagues. Similar preferences, well, if you look around here, everyone has some connections to finance and economics. We will probably have more similar choices even if we don't interact or communicate um, about something relative to the rest of the population, simply because we are a similar type of people and we have similar preferences. What that means is that just the fact that I observe correlated behavior doesn't mean I actually observe peer effects. It could be driven by these common shocks or common preferences. There's generally 
two ways to solve that identification problem. In short, what we need if we have an identification problem, we need some random variation. So the first option is looking into random networks. Where can I find peers that were randomly assigned to that person? Of course, that's not the case for most peers. Most of the time we get to choose our friends, we get to choose our colleagues to some extent, but there are certain aspects where there is a randomization aspect to that. You could think about it when uh, you go to university and you take classes, there often are multiple sections and it's to some extent random in which section you end up going. The other alternative is if I can't find such a random network, and we talk more about why this is so difficult, is to take advantage of the existing, the endogenous network, and look at a random shock, where I'm gonna trace something through the network. Okay. So random network, how is that gonna do, go? Well, if I have a random network, then I'm kind of done. I can very easily look at how the behavior of a random peer affects my, um, the individual person's behavior and I'm identified because these peers are randomly assigned. The issue, as I mentioned, is that oftentimes, first of all, it's hard to find these randomly assigned networks. But second, when we ha even when we have these, we often only um, observe the peer effects of these randomly assigned peers that are a type of subset. And so it's hard to understand maybe how different types of peers might um, affect the behavior because we simply don't have randomly assigned peers of different types. The so second option I mentioned is the idea of endogenous networks plus a random shock. So what you can do here is you can identify a random shock to a peer or a network, and then you can trace the effect through that network. So the idea here is saying, if I have two people who are similar to each other, who have similar networks, but I only shock one network, for instance, because I um, give one of these people, I make them lose their phone or I give them advice on their mortgage, or I send them to a financial literacy workshop, then I can trace how this, you know, how this disseminates through the network, and I can causally attribute it to the network because I know this was coming through the shock that I randomly observed for one part of the network, or for not one network and not the other one. And so these are generally the two options to get some form of identification either a random network or a random shock to the existing network. So now that we maybe have a data set and an identification strategy for peer effects, we might wonder why do peer effects um, matter? Why do we have them? What is the mechanism that leads people to rely on their peers? And broadly speaking, we can distinguish two channels here. The first one is information. And so peers might be a source of information. That might be because there is a lack of own experience or because um, expert advice in um, many household financial domains is lacking. So people just don't know very well how they should invest. And so they think they can get valuable information from their peers or they don't know where to shop for their mortgage. So they're gonna ask their friends who just bought homes where they got their mortgage and that will convey information. Importantly here, we can have both optimal versus suboptimal use of information. So my peers might be an easy way for me to get cheap information. It's not very hard to get this information from my peers and I might use it in an optimal way. It's definitely a reasonable thing to ask my friends. But we'll also see, we'll see some of that in um, the papers today that we can also have suboptimal use of information where people rely too much on their friend networks. Where they somehow, you know, maybe would be better off also acquiring additional information. So both of these are definitely options. The second possible mechanism for peer effects is social utility. And this is a broad set of reasons and basically this would define things where the peers actions directly enter in the utility function. 
This could be, for instance, because I compare myself to the people around me. And so my relative standing matters for my happiness. I maybe am um, happier with my small home if everyone around me and all my friends also have small homes. But then if my friends start having bigger homes, I feel unhappy about the same type of home because I feel in comparison it pays. Could also be things like the desire for recognition or um, shame about a certain behavior that makes me, that influences my financial decisions, such as you know, one of the most important shame um, aspects in our setting is probably the shame of bankruptcy or foreclosure, that I maybe feel embarrassed for the fact that I had to enter bankruptcy and that um, will influence my choices. Okay, so what I want to do next, I want to very, very, very briefly talk about the different topics um, that research has looked at before we go to the exact research papers. First, I want to talk about investors. This is the part of household finance and especially PFX that's probably most clearly in like finance, finance, and some of the earliest work and early interest was in this area. Um, people have looked at retail investors. So here there was a lot of work on using local peers like neighbors or work colleagues to look at investment decisions. Why is that useful? Because you can observe neighbors and oftentimes if you know where people work, you know who their colleagues are. Then you need the outcomes of those people and if you don't have good reasons why they should otherwise be correlated, you can attribute these to peer effects. There's a lot of work on this using international data, which is partially driven by the availability, and many papers specifically use the Scandinavian data, which for many years had stock market participation data and holding data to some extent. And so what this literature does is, first of all, document that we actually see very correlated investment decisions across peer groups. And so that suggests that peers influence the investment decisions of real estate investors. More recently, we've seen in this literature a very strong shift to not just documenting these peer effects, but also understanding why we see these peer effects, the mechanisms. And so later today, you'll see Florian talk about his paper in this area, Understanding Mechanisms Underlying P Effects, Evidence from a Field Experiment on Financial Decisions. Second, there's also a big work um, looking at professional investors. Why professional investors? This is a household finance class, but why do we still care about them? Well, this literature on retail investors faced a criticism that was that retail investors are generally not a big portion of the capital in the markets. And so they might not just not be the most important thing to study when we try to understand how capital market works. But this is where professional investors come in. Do they do the same? If so, that would be really important for asset markets, but also it would tell us something, namely that peer effects are not just driven by the fact that people do, are inexperienced or don't have a lot of other information available to them. If professional investors whose job it is to invest also rely on peer effects, there's going to be more different mechanisms that open up as possible drivers of this behavior. The second big part that we've seen research on is housing. And so just in the last decade, there was just a huge increase of research and policy interest following the 2008 financial crisis, which was to a large extent driven by household financial decisions. Housing is also one of those areas where we think that peer effects might matter a lot, partially because people have little info experience buying a home, most people buy one, maximum two homes during their lives. It's also a very important decision. And so it matters what people do and people understand that. And so they try to learn from what they see their peers doing. They try to learn about what might be good ways of going about this. The other important feature that facilitated this type of research is the high quality micro data that is available on many housing decisions in the US. So in the US, the DEETS data is in principle public. 
which means that there are you know, many ways um, to buy this data, many different ways of accessing different parts of this data. Um, and so that has opened up this research area to um, a broad range of researchers. Finally, there are also many different choices around housing. And so like home purchases, the mortgage decision, refinancing. And so there are just many, many aspects of households financial decisions in the housing market that could be studied and it could be affected by PFX. Finally, the last bit that has lent its, this topic to the study of peer effects is the idea that neighbors are really a natural peer group for housing decisions. And so once we know where someone lives and we have housing data, we can generally um, pinpoint people's locations and we can observe neighbors. And so that has also helped um, push this, this agenda. We see a lot more on housing, um, namely right after I talk, Johannes will talk about the economic effects of social networks, evidence from the housing market. And then Jordan will talk about teachers teaching teachers, the role of workplace peer effects on financial decisions. Another area of household finance is maybe our bread and butter in household finance is saving and borrowing decisions by households. So here we have a few areas that have gotten a lot of attention in terms of peer effects. The first one is retirement savings. And I think that's for multiple reasons. One of them is that work colleagues are somewhat natural peers. They are natural peer group for investing in 401k retirement plans. And second, it's marginally easier to overcome the measurement problem with these types of decisions because once you can convince a large employer to share data on their own employer sponsored retirement plan you have both you have the decision of an individual you have the decision of peers and you know who the peers are by looking at work colleagues but not just saving there's also borrowing in default um, this is often closely related to the literature of peer effects and consumption choices. So here, obviously, because you have a, um, a budget constraint, consumption choices are um, intimately tied to these borrowing and saving decisions. And there is a large literature in economics more broadly on peer effects and consumption choices. This is also really an area where I think there's just a wide variety of data sets and peer networks, um, starting with the Scandinavian data, but also going to um, you know, Singapore and like the neighbors in which units they live, um, lottery winnings in different parts of the world. And so there's really a big, big variety where people have um, found both measurement and identification to study peer effects in these saving and borrowing decisions. We'll see um, two papers related to these topics later today. Um, we see Anket's paper on peer financial distress and individual leverage. And then we see Emily's paper on social networks, reputation and commitment, evidence from a savings monitors field experiment. So hopefully um, we now have a slight um, overview of like very broadly what this area is about. And I want to very briefly speak before I move on to the research paper about doing research in this area. Since you, most of you are just starting your career and starting out new work, if you read the early literature, you see that as a lot about documenting peer effects. That is something that I think nowadays just documenting peer effects is just no longer enough for a top paper. And so you need to find something to go beyond documenting that there are some peer influence. There's different directions that you could do this. The first one is the mechanism. We still don't know that much about mechanisms. There's still a lot of open questions about the exact mechanisms in which domain. So that's one natural extension. I think another extension is the idea of heterogeneity kind of thinking, well, which peers matter when and why is that? It's not always probably my neighbors or my work colleagues that matter in the same way for the same types of decisions. And understanding that a little bit better, I think, has a lot of potential. 
Finally, the other direction to go beyond is um, the implications. Why do we care about peer effects? Why do even, you know, why do they matter? Why do we want to document them? And so here you can first go in the direction of aggregate outcomes. What aggregate outcomes are influenced by peer outcomes? What does this peer effect mean for um, regulating markets? Should we think differently about regulating consumer markets where we have strong peer effects? Because in some sense, the, um, the individual's tendency to be maybe exposed to market power might differ when we're thinking about networks that all influence each other. And related to that, the functioning of markets. How do peer effects interact with that? Can they help us by disseminating information? Or might they be um, making it harder for markets to function because we have this interconnectedness between individual decisions? <laughs> 